Do you want to get into serverless computing, one of the top paying cloud skills today? Then this course is for you. Do you want to get AWS certified? Yes? Then know that serverless computing is a key focus area in AWS certification exams at associate as well as at professional level. And this course is a must have for you. Hi, my name is Riaz and I'll be your instructor in this course. I'm a solutions architect and a co-founder of Prismax Software. I have been in the IT industry from last 14 plus years. The number one goal of this course is to provide you with the most complete, comprehensive, yet cost-effective online resource to help you become the AWS professional that you have always dreamed of becoming. This course is packed with over 20 hours of hands-on tutorials and together we'll build at least 5 serverless projects end-to-end. -end. We'll explore every bit of syntax step-by-step -step, so you understand exactly what we are doing and why we are doing it. By the end of this course, you will have mastered the AWS serverless architecture and you will become confident to take on real-world serverless projects. We'll learn serverless computing from scratch. We'll dive into it from scratch and then we'll dive into all its core features and into many advanced features as well. We'll learn how it works, why we use it and how to use it. We'll begin with AWS Lambda and API Gateway and cover everything from DynamoDB, Steph Functions to AWS SAM, the serverless framework, CI CD tools, serverless best practices, serverless architecture patterns, and everything in between. We'll not only discuss this stuff, we'll implement it together step by step. We'll build serverless workflows, process streaming data, set up authentication and authorization, build serverless APIs, serverless web app, Android and iOS mobile apps, an Alexa skill, an IoT app, and so much more. Step by step, all in this one course. Yes, you heard it right. Before beginning this course, you should have access to an AWS account and be familiar with the basics of AWS. There are no other prerequisites. I'll be using Node.js for all the demos and I have included a section on JavaScript and Node.js fundamentals. So even if you're new to Node.js, you should still be able to follow along. I'm super excited about this course because I believe this is one of the most comprehensive guides you can get on AWS Lambda and serverless computing. I designed this course as the course I wish I had access to when I was learning. And it was a lot of fun creating this course. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of fun together as we go through this course. So, let's start. Hey there, my friends. My name is Riaz and welcome to this AWS Lambda and serverless computing course. Let's get started. This course is divided into several sections. We'll begin by building a simple Hello World example with API Gateway and AWS Lambda. And this should get you started with serverless computing. We'll first cover the basics of AWS serverless architecture, covering AWS Lambda, API Gateway, and DynamoDB. And then we'll dive deeper into these topics and cover the advanced concepts as well. We'll also learn building serverless workflow patterns using step functions, and then I'll teach you the best approach to building serverless applications, which is using frameworks like AWS SAM and the serverless framework. We'll take this further and I'll show you how to automate and streamline your serverless delivery and deployment with CI CD tools like AWS Code Commit, Code Build, and Code Pipeline. We'll also learn some of the best practices of serverless computing and study different serverless architecture patterns. We'll not only study these serverless architecture patterns, we'll implement them. 
as we build several end-to-end -end full stack projects. And I'm sure this course will give you enough practical experience to take on and tackle real-world serverless projects. I'll be using Node.js for all the demos in this course. And I have included a section on JavaScript and Node.js fundamentals at the end of this course. So if you're new to Node.js, do go through that section before you begin with the next section. We'll also use JSON and YAML extensively in this course. And I have included an optional section on JSON and YAML fundamentals at the end of this course. So if you're new to JSON or YAML, do go through that section before you begin with the course starting from the next section. All right. This course is available in the form of easy to follow videos. You can pause, rewind or speed up each video to suit your needs so you can learn at a pace that's comfortable for you. And I'll be there if you ever have a question or need help. All the source code is also available for download inside the resources section. So before we go sprinting down the aisle and take it all in, I just wanted to take a moment and say thank you for being here. I'm so honored to be able to share my knowledge with you here today. I hope this journey is both fruitful and exciting for you. I enjoyed creating this course for you and I hope you enjoy it too as you follow along. So let's get started in the next lecture. I'll see you there in just a few seconds. In the recent years, computing technology has been evolving at a phenomenal rate. Data storage has become very affordable and computing power has vastly increased. And this has allowed us to build applications that leverage these advancements in computing space. Cloud computing, for example, has made it possible for us to build cutting edge applications at a fraction of a cost. Not just for big companies, but also for individual people. Public cloud providers like Amazon AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform have removed the entry barriers and made computing very easy and affordable for common people. Having said that, the modern day applications demand high level of power, high level of compute power, as well as speed. For example, if your Facebook app doesn't show you what you need to see as soon as you open the Facebook app, most of you might simply close the app and move on. So the application has to be fast and responsive. And at the same time, it must be scalable with almost no downtime. Serverless computing is this new trend in cloud computing, which attempts to solve many of these challenges. Serverless computing will help you build next generation of systems that can handle demanding workloads and scale indefinitely without having to provision or manage any servers. Now, if you look at the traditional architecture, there are several activities and tasks that you must perform in order to run any particular application. First, you got to create and set up servers, install operating systems, install and set up databases, manage software patches and hardware updates, manage capacity and scaling, manage uh, high availability through load balancing and so on. And of course, this server infrastructure and the computing power has its own costs, which are often substantial. On the other hand, with serverless architecture, all these mundane tasks of uh, managing the underlying infrastructure are abstracted away from us. So in a way, when you use serverless architecture, you won't really feel like you're using any high-end servers because you're not the one who is actually taking care of it. That's the reason this approach is called as serverless. That means serverless computing still uses servers, but you no longer have to worry about managing them or worry about the uptime, availability, or anything that has to do with the infrastructure part. With serverless, you kind of get to be more productive. 
you can completely focus on writing your code without having to worry about the underlying support system. So you simply upload your code to the cloud provider and it can run on demand as and when needed. With serverless, you write your code in the form of functions, just like you would write a function in any programming language. And these functions then run in the cloud. So you segregate your application logic into small independent functions or microservices and upload them to the cloud provider. These functions are stateless and can be invoked in response to different events. These events could be file uploads, database updates, in-app activity, API calls, website clicks, sensor outputs, just like those from IoT devices, and so on. And all this can be accomplished without having to manage any infrastructure or having to size, provision, or scale a bunch of servers, and without having to uh, worry about performance and availability. And this seriously allows us to laser focus on our application code and not get caught up in multitude of infrastructure issues. Now, to talk in a more technical terms, these serverless functions often run in Docker-like containers. And hence, several instances of these functions can be run concurrently, like in a Docker Swarm, for example, thus making them highly, highly scalable. If you're new to these terms like Docker or container, nothing to worry. You really don't need to know about these terms uh, to be able to build serverless applications. All this containerization happens behind the scenes and is completely taken care of by the cloud provider, in our case, AWS. Just for your information though, containers are a lightweight alternative to virtualization. They allow you to run your code in isolated, pre-configured environments. All this, however, is abstracted away from us when we build serverless applications in the AWS cloud. So no need to break your head if uh, this is new to you. In this course, we'll go over everything that you need to know to master serverless computing. So please hang in there you will have more clarity as we build our first serverless application in the next couple of minutes. So in a nutshell, serverless means event-driven computing using small independent stateless functions running inside containers in the cloud. That's the short definition of what serverless is all about. So you have your code running on the cloud platform, AWS in our case, and whenever the triggering event occurs, the cloud platform spins up a container or initializes a container, loads the function in it, and executes the function. And this happens almost instantaneously, thereby allowing us to build applications that respond quickly to new information and thus enhance the user experience. Once the function completes execution, it optionally returns a response back to the caller and then finally exits or shuts down. AWS provides a compute service called AWS Lambda, which essentially allows you to create and run serverless functions in the cloud. And in the very next lecture, I'm going to take you through a quick hands-on lab where we'll create a Hello World API using AWS Lambda and API Gateway. AWS Lambda and API Gateway are the two of the core services of the AWS serverless platform. So if you're ready for a quick hands-on, let's jump in and get our hands dirty and we start learning by doing. In the next few lectures, we are going to create our first serverless API. In this hands-on lab, I'm going to introduce you to two key pieces of AWS serverless platform, AWS Lambda and API Gateway. So if you're ready, let's get started. Sign in to your AWS console at aws.amazon.com. 
This is the AWS dashboard. The first service we'll look at is the Amazon API Gateway. Simply start typing API in the search box and you should be able to get to API Gateway. If you haven't created any APIs before in this account, this is the screen you're most likely to see. AWS does change its UI often, so you might see a different UI, but more or less, uh, it should provide you with a similar functionality. So let's get started. Here you'll find an option to create an API. We're going to create a new API manually. So let's choose new API option and give our API a name. Let's say we call it hello world and hit the create API button. Awesome. We'll now be presented with this resources screen where we create resources and methods for our API. Go to actions and click on create resource. Let's call it message, for example. And AWS will suggest a resource path or an API endpoint. This will be appended to our API's root URL. Hit the create resource button. Instead of the manual approach we are taking now, there are better ways of creating APIs with API Gateway. And I'll take you through each of those approaches later when we dive deeper into this. For now, let's get familiar with the API Gateway console. All right. Once we have our resource created, we'll add a method to it. A method is an HTTP verb like get, post, patch, delete, and so on. So from the actions menu, choose create method. And here you can choose any of the HTTP verbs. I'm going to choose the get method here. So we can test our API directly from the browser. Select the get method and click the check mark button. We have a couple of integration types here. We have Lambda function, HTTP, mock, AWS service, and VPC link. What I'm going to do right now is select a mock response. So we simply hard code and return a dummy response from within the API gateway. Click Save. This will take us to the method execution screen. It does sound a bit scary when you see the screen for the first time, but don't worry. It's easy when you understand the idea. When we make an API call, the incoming request is passed from the method request block to the integration request block, where we map or transform the incoming request to the format that our backend understands. In our case, there is no backend since we are simply mocking a response using the mock integration type. The response received from the backend is then mapped or transformed in the integration response block to match the format that the calling application expects. And then the method response relays the response back to the client. We'll get to the details of each of these later. For now, let's mock a response by returning a hard-coded JSON string. Click on integration response here and expand this response for HTTP 200 status. Then under mapping templates, you'll find a template for application JSON content type. Click on that. And this is where we map the response returned by the backend to the response expected by the client application. So let's simply add a simple JSON string here. Let's say a key message with value hello world. Save that and we're done. 
we can now deploy this API so we can test it from the browser. So from the Actions menu, choose Deploy API. We have to create a deployment stage here. So we can have different uh, stages for deployment, testing, and production pipelines, for example. So choose a new stage and give it a name. Let's say test and click deploy. So now we are on the stages screen and our API has an invoke URL to call the API. And the URL also includes the name of our deployment stage. Let's click on this URL to open it in a new tab. It says missing authentication token. This is because this is the root of the API and there is no get method at the API root. Our get method is at the slash message endpoint. So if you go to the resources section and look at the methods, you will see that our endpoint is at slash message. So let's copy the endpoint path and we'll paste it right after the API root here. Hit enter. And there we go. We see hello world printed at the output. Amazing. We can also test this method from the method execution screen right here by clicking this test button. We don't have any path or query parameters for this method. Simply click the test button and we should see hello world here as well. Awesome. That was fairly easy, right? We created an API endpoint with a few clicks on the API Gateway Console. And since it was a get method, we could also see the response directly in the browser. This was a very simple example. What we basically did here is we mocked a response within the API Gateway and more importantly, uh, this was accomplished without setting up any servers, meaning it's a serverless API. And the intention of this lab was to give you a feel of the API Gateway Console. In the next lecture, we'll make this API a little more dynamic by replacing this mock response with a serverless function using AWS Lambda. So let's continue to the next lecture. In this lecture, we're going to create a serverless function or a Lambda function and hook it up with the API we created in the last lecture. This will allow us to return a dynamic message instead of simply hard coding a hello world string. So let's get started. On the AWS dashboard from the services menu, I'm going to select Lambda from under compute and open it in a new tab. Click on create function to create a new serverless function. We can author it from scratch or use a blueprint as a starting point, or we can also choose a function from the serverless application repository. This is the repository of serverless apps created by the AWS developer community. We're going to author the function from scratch. So we keep the author from scratch option selected. Let's name our function, say get random message. And for the runtime, we can use any of these runtimes. We're going to use the Node.js for all the demos in this course. Node 6.10 has been selected by default here. We can also use Node 8.10. Let's use the default 6.10 for now. And in the next video, I'll show you how to use the Node 8.10 runtime as well. Then for role, we can choose an existing role or we can create a new role either from templates or we can create a custom role ourselves. We're going to create a custom role. So choose create a custom role option from the drop down. 
And this will take us to the IAM, Identity and Access Management. We can either accept the default role name or change it. I'm going to change it slightly, just in case I have an existing role with the same name. So I'll add underscore role at the end, for example. If we click on the view policy document option, we should be able to see the role policy here. This policy simply grants access to CloudWatch logs. So our Lambda function can write logs to the AWS CloudWatch service. So click on allow and that's it. The role has been added to our Lambda function. Click on create function button to continue. Our function is ready now and you can see that it has access to Amazon CloudWatch logs. If you scroll down, you can see the function code. It's using the node 6.10 runtime and handler is index.handler. Index.handler simply means a function named handler defined within the index.js file. So it's fairly straightforward. The event argument receives the incoming data from the triggering event. The context object sets the context of the function from the execution environment. Callback is the callback function that returns the response back to the caller. We'll look into the specifics of these arguments a little later. For now, we don't need either of these. So we'll create an array of few messages and return a random message as the function response. So let's declare an array variable called messages. And inside it, I'll add a few message strings. Let's say, hello world, hello serverless. And I'm going to paste in some more strings that I already have with me just to save some time. And then inside the handler function, we'll pick a random string from this messages array. So let's say, let message equal to messages array. And inside it, uh, we can use math.random. Math.random is going to give us a random number from zero to one, of excluding one, of course. So we multiply that by 10 to get a random number between zero to 10. And as you can see, we have about 10 messages here. So we're trying to get a random number between zero to 10, excluding 10, of course. And then we'll use math.floor to convert this number into an integer. So now that we have a random message, we simply return it back via the callback. So we can remove this part, the HTTP response part here, and simply return the message variable via the callback, just like that. That's about it. Save the function. It's a pretty simple function, good enough for us to get a hang of AWS Lambda. To test this function, click on test button. We know that serverless functions are event driven. So we'll need to configure a test event. Our function doesn't expect any input data. So we simply create an empty event to test it. Name the event, let's say empty event data. All right, click create. And now we should be able to test this function. Click the test button once again. And we have a success response. Let's expand it. Doing everything I love. Awesome. If we test it again, it's going to return some other string. Yay, I'm learning something new today. And yes, indeed, we learned to build serverless stuff today. Amazing. You'll see the log output here and you'll be able to see the same log output if you click on this logs link. It will take us to the CloudWatch console where 
these logs are stored. Let's click the latest one. And it's going to show us uh, basically when the function started, when it ended, and some other information like uh, how long this function ran, what was the build duration, and so on. Now we can uh, hook this Lambda function to our API in the API gateway to make our function return this dynamic message. Why don't we do that in the very next lecture? So let's continue to the next lecture and I'll see you there in just a bit. Now that we have our Lambda function ready, Let's go to API Gateway Console and hook this function to our API. Let's open the get method. We change the integration type from mock to lambda function. So click on integration request. Change the integration type from mock to lambda function. My lambda function is in the region US US2. So if you look at the Lambda console, you'll find the region code in the URL here. All right, then we simply start typing the name of our Lambda function. That is uh, get random message and that shows up here. And click on save. It will ask us to confirm that we want to switch to Lambda integration. Because we're changing the integration type from mock to lambda, it's going to ask us. Click OK to confirm. And now it's going to ask to give permissions to API Gateway to invoke our lambda function. Click OK. And AWS will automatically assign the necessary permissions to the API Gateway service to invoke our lambda function. Let's go back to the method execution screen so we can test uh, this new API. Click test. There are no parameters for this method, so simply click the test button. And we can see the response body over the moon. But now the response we see is slightly different from what we had earlier with the mock integration. It's a plain text string and if you see the response from our earlier test, we see a JSON string or a JSON object with key message and a corresponding value. So we have to actually convert this Lambda response to JSON format. So let's go back in here and click on integration response. Expand the HTTP 200 status response. And under mapping templates, select application JSON content type. Here we have to specify the transformation rules to map the incoming data to the expected JSON format. We create a simple JSON string here, just like we did in the last lecture. We add a key called message, and in the value, Instead of hard coding, we pass the body of the Lambda response, the response we received from the Lambda function. We can access the Lambda response body using $input.body, just like that. $input is a predefined variable, and we'll discuss more on this a little later in the course. For now, just save this. and. Back to the method execution screen. Let's test it locally first before we deploy the API. Click on test. And we have the JSON response. Wow. But we see the double quotes appearing twice here. So to correct that, let's go back once again to integration response. And we can just remove these codes here. Save and let's try it again. Click on test. 
and there we go hello serverless click it again and it should show some other message wow it's a great day today and indeed it is right amazing now before we can test this in the browser we have to redeploy our api so once you've completed testing locally we can choose deploy api from the actions menu select a stage and deploy and now our api has been deployed this is the api root url and we have to append it with our resource endpoint that is slash message so if you refresh this page we should see a new response every time and we can see a different message as we refresh the browser world at my feet over the moon amazing i hope you're over the moon as well. So I hope this quick hands-on on AWS Lambda and API Gateway has you pumped up and excited and made you interested to learn even more about this amazing world of serverless computing. And if it has, let's continue further and we'll dig into this even deeper. So thank you for joining me here and I'll see you in the next lecture in just a few seconds. We used the Node.js 6.10 runtime in the last lecture. So I'm going to quickly show you the same example using Node.js 8.10 runtime. So inside the Lambda function, we simply switch the runtime from 6.10 to 8.10. Save the function and it's still going to work because this JavaScript code is valid in Node.js 8.10 as well. So let's test it out. And we can see that it's working well. And if you wanted to use the async await feature that's uh, supported by this new Node.js 8.10 runtime, you can do that as well. So what I'm going to do is simply add async here before the function definition. And in that case, we won't have a callback. So we remove the callback. And inside the function, instead of the callback, we simply return the message. Just like that. We don't need to await anything here. So I'm not going to use the await operator. So save the function and let's test it out. And it's working fine. So it's still a great day today. And if we go back to our API in the browser and test it, it's going to work. We don't have to redeploy the API in this case because we did not change the uh, we did not change anything in the API gateway. So refresh this page and we can see that it's still working. Just to demonstrate that the API is actually showing the response from our new Lambda function running on node 8.10, let's go back to the Lambda console and change our message string slightly. So what I'm going to do is simply add an uh, extra exclamation mark to each of these message strings. Save the function. And now if we refresh the browser, we should see messages with two exclamation marks. And it's working as expected. So it's still a great day today. Awesome. So thank you for your time. And in the next lecture, we look at some key features along with some pros and cons of serverless architecture.
Now let's talk a little more on the pros and cons of serverless computing. First, as we discussed, there are no servers or operating systems or hardware or software to maintain. And that makes our life as a developer or DevOps so much easier. So kind of more me time for you and you can be more productive and be able to laser focus on creating stunning applications. So serverless is all about faster innovation, high productivity and faster time to market. And in most cases, serverless applications require little to no administration. All right, the next benefit is easy and efficient scaling. Serverless applications can be scaled automatically or at the most with a few clicks to choose your desired capacity. And there is no need to create any specialized uh, scalable architecture or designs. You can get a large number of uh, serverless functions running within seconds and each function runs for a few hundred milliseconds to a few minutes. And you can allocate resources for each of these functions individually. And this is going to allow us to scale our application easily and at the same time efficiently. Thirdly, serverless approach provides built-in high availability and fault tolerance. You don't need to have any specialized infrastructure to make your applications highly available or fault tolerant. All your applications get this benefit of availability and fault tolerance by default, irrespective of whether you're just building a Hello World app for your testing or you're building the next Facebook or YouTube. Service integration is another benefit. AWS provides a host of services that readily integrate with each other. And this is something that's going to allow you to perform a lot of stuff very, very easily. For example, you could be sending text notifications, emails, running analytics, hosting APIs, storing files, running automated workflows, deploying machine learning models and so on. And all this can integrate seamlessly with your serverless application. Then the real benefit of serverless is that there is no idle capacity. You pay only for what you use and no more. For example, with traditional architecture, say you created a server with 100 gigs of memory and you are only using about 10 gigs of it. You will still have to pay for the 90 gigs you never used. But with the serverless architecture, you only pay for what you use. Uh, if you use 10 gigs, you only pay for those 10 gigs. Also with AWS Lambda, which is the core component of Amazon's serverless platform, you pay only for the time your code runs. So there is no charge if your code is not running. If your code runs for say 100 milliseconds, then you're charged only for that 100 milliseconds and no more. And that's really a very fine grained control. And certainly this results in a substantial cost savings for your business. Even with all these benefits, serverless may not be the solution for all your problems. It's not a silver bullet and uh, does come with some challenges. Not many though. The first one is vendor lockets. So there are a handful of cloud providers like Amazon AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, IBM Cloud, and there are some more. And they really want you to use more and more of their services, of course, for obvious reasons. And they want to build an ecosystem of related services that work together. This may not be really a deal breaker though, and we'll discuss what is called as multi-provider serverless later in the course as a way to alleviate this challenge. Another concern with serverless is the public cloud. The serverless architectures run on the public cloud. 
So some use cases or industry specific uh, regulatory requirements may be a deterrent to using this public cloud. So these cases might be very few, but then again, if your use case lies in this category, then serverless may not be a good fit. Having said that, serverless can be run on private clouds as well. So you could still leverage serverless in such cases. However, we're not going to get into that discussion here. Let's just focus on uh, AWS serverless platform for our purpose here. Another point to keep in mind is the level of control. So essentially you're giving up some degree of control by letting someone else manage the infrastructure for you. And in some situations uh, wherein you need more control of the hardware resources or of the OS level resources, this might prove to be a limitation. The core component of AWS serverless architecture is the compute service called AWS Lambda. Lambda lets you run your serverless functions in the AWS cloud. AWS Lambda was launched back in 2014 and that's when the idea of serverless was born. The other players quickly followed suit and with growing use of social media, streaming data and Internet of Things devices, the relevance of serverless computing is rising very, very rapidly. AWS Lambda is still the market leader in the serverless space. If you look at this Google Trends graph comparing the major players in serverless space, you will see that Lambda has been growing consistently and at a much faster pace than the other players. Although Lambda itself is fairly new, having launched just a few years back, the other players like Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Functions, IBM Cloud Functions are even newer. Similarly, AWS as a cloud provider is still preferred highly as compared to other players like Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, and the IBM Cloud. Besides being the first to enter the serverless space, AWS Lambda has its strength being part of the huge AWS ecosystem, thereby allowing seamless integration with host of other AWS services. In this course, we're going to mainly focus on the serverless offerings provided by the AWS platform. So in the next lecture, let's look at the core services in the AWS ecosystem that form the foundation of this serverless platform on AWS. And we'll also talk about uh, some additional AWS services that are popularly used along with the core services in the AWS serverless space. As part of its serverless platform, AWS provides a set of web services that you can use to build and run your serverless applications. So in this lecture, let me give you a quick overview of different AWS services that form the AWS serverless platform. All these services are fully managed, meaning you can focus on your core application logic and AWS does the rest for you. There are three core services that you can find in almost every serverless application. And these are AWS Lambda, Amazon API Gateway, and AWS DynamoDB. These services are the foundation or the backbone of the AWS serverless platform, so to say. And then there are additional web services that you can use in serverless applications, depending on your use case. And these could be Amazon S3, SNS, SQS, AWS Step Functions, Kinesis, Athena, and so on. So let's go over these services briefly, and then we'll discuss the common use cases of the serverless architecture as well. When it comes to serverless applications, AWS Lambda is the most important service that you will need in your serverless applications. 
AWS Lambda lets you run your code without having to create or manage any servers. You simply upload your code to Lambda and Lambda does the rest for you and ensures that your code runs on highly scalable and highly available infrastructure. Each piece of code that you upload to Lambda is called as a Lambda function and it runs in an independent, isolated environment, also called as a container. As discussed earlier, with Lambda, you only pay for the time your code runs and there is no charge when your code is not running. Lambda provides fine-grained access control, letting you decide who can invoke the Lambda functions and which services can be executed by the Lambda functions. Lambda also comes with version management capabilities, allowing you to manage your deployments efficiently. Second service is Amazon API Gateway. API Gateway, as the name indicates, helps you create and publish APIs, and it tightly integrates with AWS Lambda to let you create completely serverless APIs. Again, this is a fully managed service and you can use it to build RESTful APIs. RESTful APIs are the APIs that follow a client-server model where client is stateful and the server is completely stateless. Uh, these APIs can then be consumed by your web or mobile applications, allowing you to uh, interact with uh, different AWS services through your code running on Lambda. API Gateway can handle thousands of concurrent API calls and also gives you full control to create your APIs with fine-grained access control and version management capabilities. The third service of the serverless platform is Amazon DynamoDB. DynamoDB is highly scalable, high-performance, NoSQL serverless database. DynamoDB can scale on demand to support virtually unlimited concurrent read write operations with response times in single digit milliseconds. And then you have DynamoDB DAX or a DynamoDB Accelerator, which further can bring down the response times from milliseconds to microseconds. DAX is a caching service that is provided by Amazon on top of Amazon DynamoDB. AWS Lambda, API Gateway, and DynamoDB are the three most commonly used services in serverless applications. And we'll dive deeper into all three of these services in the upcoming sections of this course. Now, depending on your use cases, you might need other services as well. So let's look at these additional services right in the next lecture. Amazon Simple Storage Service, or S3, is a very simple and intuitive web service that you can use to store and access your data from anywhere on the web and with fine-grained access control. S3 also lets you build static websites that can interact with your Lambda code. So you can really use S3 as a front end of your serverless applications. With serverless applications, since there are no servers, you need a reliable way for different web services or different software components to talk to each other or communicate with each other. And AWS provides two services that you can use here for in-process messaging, SNS and SQS. SNS or Simple Notification Service is a fully managed notification service that allows you to publish notifications and any services or software components that subscribe to these notifications will receive the messages. Second service is SQS or Simple Queue Service. This is a very simple and intuitive uh, messaging service that you can use to send and receive messages at virtually any volume. SQS allows multiple publishers and consumers to read and write messages from the same queue 
and uh, it can retain these messages up to a certain predefined time period or until you explicitly delete the message. And then in any serverless application, there could be several Lambda functions working together and your application might need a way to orchestrate these functions. That is, uh, execute them in a specific order or depending on certain logic or certain conditions that might be known at the runtime. So AWS Step Functions is a service that helps you with this orchestration. AWS Step Functions let you build visual workflows to coordinate different Lambda functions to work together and form a larger serverless application. Then coming to analytics, uh, Amazon provides two web services, Amazon Kinesis and Amazon Athena. Kinesis is a platform for streaming data applications. And if your application requires you to work with or analyze streaming data in real time, you may want to use Amazon Kinesis. Amazon Athena is an interactive query service that you can use to query your data stored in uh, Amazon S3 using standard SQL syntax. You also have uh, debugging tools like AWS X-Ray and debugging and logging tools like AWS CloudWatch. Then we have AWS Cognito, which is serverless user authentication and management service. It supports authentication of users for your application via username and passwords and also via federated identity or open ID providers like Facebook, Google, Twitter, Amazon, and so on. And you can also have your own custom uh, open ID providers. So we discussed some of the many AWS services that we can use with our serverless applications. And we'll explore these services throughout this course. AWS also provides you with fully functional SDKs that you can use to build your serverless applications. AWS Lambda supports several programming languages like Node.js or JavaScript, Python, Java, C Sharp, .NET Core, and also Google Go. Throughout this course, we'll build several demos and learn how to make use of these services within our serverless applications. In the next lecture, let's go over some of the prominent use cases for the serverless architecture. Let's look at some of the use cases for serverless applications. The serverless architecture allows us to build just about any type of application or backend service that you can think of. Let's go over some of the most common use cases where you can use serverless architecture. The first and the most prominent one is application backends. Serverless allows you to build backends for web, mobile, or even IoT applications. And later in this course, we'll build all these three types of backends together with hands on. Serverless web applications and their backends typically make use of AWS Lambda, API Gateway, DynamoDB, S3, or even step functions as needed. End users might interact with your applications through web, mobile smartphones, or even IoT devices. And these front ends act as event sources to trigger our Lambda code. Each incoming request from the end user is typically received by one of the endpoints exposed by API Gateway. API Gateway then triggers a call to Lambda function and Lambda function then coordinates uh, with different web services like uh, S3, DynamoDB to generate a response and then returns that response back to the end user, possibly through the same channel like API Gateway. Amazon S3 can also be used to create the app frontends in this case. These frontends are wired to the 
serverless backends by means of the APIs that we create using the API gateway. Such applications could have very unpredictable usage patterns with, uh, for example, periods of extremely high user traffic followed by minimal to no traffic and your application must be geared to handle these spikes in traffic without the need for any expensive infrastructure. With AWS Lambda, your applications can scale on demand and you pay only for what you use. And in most cases, such serverless applications require almost zero administration. Another use case for serverless architecture is real-time data processing systems or streaming data processing systems. You can use Amazon Kinesis or Kinesis Firehose with Lambda, DynamoDB and S3 to create your real-time data processing systems. These systems typically have variable workloads and serverless approach helps here by uh, helping with the automatic scaling during high workloads and then scaling down and saving costs during the idle time. Amazon Kinesis is a service that lets you collect, process, and analyze real-time streaming data from uh, multiple sources at, at absolutely any scale. And you can literally process terabytes of data every hour coming in from thousands and thousands of sources simultaneously. For example, social media streaming data from several sources can be loaded into Kinesis simultaneously and then processed in real time using AWS Lambda and DynamoDB. Kinesis also provides data analytics services that can be used to build real-time analytics applications. And later in this course, we go through the hands-on demos where we'll process streaming data from Kinesis as well as from DynamoDB streams using AWS Lambda. Automation and continuous delivery are even more crucial when building serverless applications. These tools make your life as a developer or as DevOps so much easier. A typical serverless application would have several many Lambda functions and a number of APIs or API endpoints and configuring each of them manually, maintaining their versions and following a uniform development process or deployment process manually is not a great idea. It's time consuming and of course, prone to errors. Automating these tasks fully or at least partly will make your application lifecycle easier and manageable in the long run. Ideally, you should be able to maintain a code base in a source control system or version control system, run tests and deploy your application automatically. The only time you should deploy Lambda functions manually or configure API gateway using the web console is while you learn. Once you begin working on real serverless applications, you should have a well-defined deployment process and ideally it should be automated. There are several tools that play an important role here and we'll quickly go through these uh, in this lecture and later in the course, we'll learn how to use these tools as well. There are two frameworks that help you work with your serverless applications efficiently the AWS SAM and the serverless framework. AWS SAM or the serverless application model is a tool provided by AWS, while the serverless framework is a popular third-party tool provided by a company named Serverless Inc. First, let's talk about the AWS SAM or the serverless application model. SAM is a lightweight version of AWS CloudFormation. CloudFormation is a service that allows you to automate creating and deploying various AWS services quickly using a text-based template file. 
AWS SAM uses a similar template file but with a simplified syntax, more suited for serverless applications. CloudFormation internally converts this SAM template into the standard CloudFormation syntax to create and deploy our serverless resources. We'll dive deeper into SAM and learn how to use it later in this course. Now let's discuss the alternative third-party framework called the serverless framework. This is an open source tool and works on a similar lines as the AWS SAM. The template syntax it uses, however, is slightly different, but equally easy. The serverless framework is quite a popular tool and many organizations are using it for their application deployments. The serverless framework also has a open source plugin system which allows anyone to extend its functionality and hence it provides rich features apart from just being able to deploy serverless resources. We'll learn how to use the serverless framework later in the course. Irrespective of which framework you use, continuous integration or continuous delivery is something you should consider using in order to automate your application deployment process. AWS provides a host of tools for this purpose. AWS Code Commit is a version control or source control system that provides a Git based repository and you can use it as your code base. This allows you to maintain private repositories of your application code. And as of recording this video, the AWS free tier provides you with uh, unlimited private repositories with about 50 GB of storage and 10,000 Git requests per month for up to, I believe, five users at no cost to you. Then we have uh, AWS Code Build, which allows you to build your serverless code and create or update AWS resources automatically via CloudFormation. This allows you to deploy your serverless applications as well. AWS Code Pipeline then is a service that allows you to define the delivery or deployment cycle from source repository through deployment and automate the application deployment process or the application deployment pipeline. Later in the course, we'll learn how to use these tools together to automate the deployment process for our serverless applications. That's all for this lecture. In the next lecture, let's get our development environment set up. So we are ready for hands-on practice as we dive deeper into serverless computing with AWS. So thank you for your time and I'll see you in the next lecture in just a few seconds. In this video, we'll create and set up a new AWS user to access AWS. This will allow us to connect to AWS resources from our local computer. We'll also install AWS CLI tools so we can connect to AWS using the command line or the terminal. If you're going to practice the examples presented in this course with me, then please do follow along with this video and have your local environment set up before we dive into hands-on sessions. To get started, you'll need access to an AWS account. I'm assuming that you did the last Hello World example with me and so you already have an AWS account. However, if you still do not have one, this is the time to sign up for a free AWS account on the AWS website at aws.amazon.com. You can also log into AWS using your amazon.com retail account. So pause this video here and grab your AWS account details. Once you have them with you, sign into the AWS console at aws.amazon.com and we'll continue from there. All right, I hope you're logged into your AWS account now. So let's set up a new AWS user. It's fairly simple to do that. 
from the AWS console, search for IAM and open it. Go to users page and click on add user. Let's name the user as serverless admin. You can name it whatever you like, but since we're going to use this user later on with the serverless framework to deploy our applications, naming it as serverless admin might make it easy for us to remember that this is a framework user. And since we'll use this user to connect to AWS from our applications, we only need to provide this user with programmatic access. AWS console access is not required since we'll not be logging into AWS console with this user. But if you want to log into AWS console with this user, then you may want to enable this console access as well. I'm going to leave it unchecked though. When you choose only the programmatic access, AWS will not create any password for this user and will only create a set of API credentials, that is an access key and a secret key. Click next. Now we need to tell AWS what permissions this user would require. Click on attach existing policies directly search for and select administrator access this is going to provide this user full access to your aws account ideally we may not want to do this but the serverless framework is kind of permission hungry and requires a lot of permissions for the framework user so while we are learning, it's best to use administrator access so we can focus on learning. So be sure to keep the credentials for this user in a safe place. Click next and review if everything looks fine. And then click create user button to create this user. AWS will show us the API credentials. Copy or download them to your local computer and Keep them in a safe place. There are several ways to set up these credentials on our computer. We're going to simply add them to our environment variables on our computer. I'm using Windows 10 for this course. Steps to set up the environment variables on Mac or Linux are slightly different and I'll come to it in a bit. If you're on Windows, Preferably log in with administrator access and then from the start menu search for environment variables and choose to edit environment variables for your account. Then under user variables click new. Add API credentials we downloaded as key value pairs here. So let's add AWS access key ID as the key and our actual access key for the user we just created as its value. Similarly, we'll also add AWS secret access key as key and our actual secret key for this user as its value. It's also a good idea to set up a default region so let's add one more environment variable, AWS default region, and set this up with value for the default AWS region uh, that you're using. I'll be using US West 2, and you could use the same or any region that's closest to you. You can choose a suitable region from the top right corner of your AWS management console. You could also do the same thing via the command prompt or PowerShell by using the set command as shown here. If you're on Mac or Linux, you can set up your environment variables via the terminal. So simply open up your terminal and 
use the export command as shown here. In the next lecture, let's install the AWS CLI so we can interact with AWS using the command line or the terminal. In this lecture, we'll install the AWS CLI or the command line tool to work with AWS from the command line or from the terminal. I'm assuming that you've created an IAM user, downloaded the credentials and have set up the environment variables. If not, please review the previous video. Specifically, you should have added the AWS access key ID, AWS secret access key, and the default region to your environment variables. All right, let's continue. We can simply Google for AWS CLI install and we should be able to find the page. I'm also putting a direct link in the resources section of this video so you can use it to go to the download page. Use the left sidebar to look at the installable for your operating system. I'm using Windows, so I'll locate it here. If you're on Mac or Linux, you can use the appropriate link. The easiest way for Mac or Linux OS is to use the bundled installer using the link here. I'm on Windows, so I'm gonna find the installation package on the Windows link. If you scroll down, you'll find upgraded MSI installers and these use the latest version of Python. You can download the appropriate version. I'm on 64-bit machine, so I'll use the first link. If you're not sure whether you have a 64 or 32-bit machine, simply download the installer from this third link and it would automatically detect the type of machine you have. So let's download and run this install. And we should be good to go. If you're on Windows, you can use the command prompt or PowerShell. And on Mac and Linux, you will use the terminal to run these CLI commands. An AWS CLI command always starts with AWS followed by the name of the service and then the name of the action that we intend to perform. And after that, we specify additional options relevant to the requested action. For example, if we say AWS help and hit enter, it would give us the syntax documentation for using this CLI. You can scroll down using the enter key and use control C to exit. Similarly, if we say AWS Lambda help and hit enter, we would get the documentation for using CLI with the AWS Lambda service. You can find the same documentation over the web as well. Simply Google for AWS Lambda CLI commands and the first results should take you to the appropriate page. I have also added the link to this documentation in the resources section of this video, so you can open it directly as well. That's about it. In the next lecture, we'll install Node.js, VS Code, and Postman. I'll be using Node.js for all the demos in this course, so I'll show you how to install Node.js on your computer. And optionally, you can also install an IDE or integrated development environment of your choice to write your code. I'll be using the IDE that I like, which is VS Code. And if you'd like to use it as well, I'll show you how to install it. Many of our demos will include HTTP or REST APIs. So you'll need some kind of API testing tool. You can use any tool of your choice. I like using Postman tools, so if you'd like to use it as well, I'll show you how to install it. If you're familiar with these tabs or have these tools already installed, you can skip over to the next lecture. 
All right, let's install Node.js. If you're on Mac or Linux, open the terminal, or on Windows, open the command prompt or PowerShell. First, let's find out if you have Node on your machine or not. So run node space dash dash version. You can see that on this machine, I'm running node version 8.11.1. On your machine, you may or may not have node installed, or you might have a different version. Either way, I want you to install the latest version of node. So open up your browser and head over to node.js.org. On this page, you can see we have two versions of Node. One is the latest table version, LTS version 8.11.4, which is recommended for most users at the time of recording this video. And there's always a newer version, which is experimental, and it might not be stable. So I want you to install the latest table version that you see in your browser. The latest version might change in future. However, the installation steps would mostly remain the same. So let's go ahead, download the LTS version for your operating system, and run the installer. Simply follow the prompts and your installation will be done. Once done, go back to the command prompt or terminal and let's run node dash dash version one more time. And you can see that I upgraded my node to version 8.11.4. Now let's install an IDE if you don't have one already. You can use any IDE of your choice or you can as well use any simple text editor like Notepad, Notepad++, Sublime or the likes. I prefer using VS Code and this is available across platforms. So if you'd like to use VS Code as well, go to code.visualstudio.com in your browser. And here, download the installer for your operating system. Run the installer and follow the prompts. The installation should be straightforward. Optionally, you can check the options to enable open with code context menu and associate related files with VS Code. I like to have them all checked. Continue with the setup and you should be all set. We also need a tool to test our APIs. So we're going to install Postman app. You can also install the Postman Chrome extension if you like. So head over to getpostman.com slash apps and download the installer and run it. And the installation should be straightforward. That's about it. Let's test the setup in the very next video. Now let's test the setup to make sure we have done everything correctly. Open VS Code or launch command prompt or the terminal if you're using any other IDE. To open the terminal from within VS Code, simply run control backtick and run node dash dash version. You should see the node version that we just installed. Now let's test if we can connect to AWS from our machine. From the terminal, type AWS STS get dash caller dash identity, just like that, and hit enter. And this should display information about the AWS serverless admin user that we created and added to the environment variables. If it does, that means we have configured the environment variables correctly. 
if you see an error that means environment variables were not set up or were set up incorrectly and you have to set them up again. So if you're seeing any errors, you might want to review the earlier video where we added environment variables. That's about it. We have our environment ready for building the demos in this course. So let's keep going. Now we have our development environment ready and we also have a fair idea of what we are going to learn in this course. So before we continue further, in this lecture, I'll share my recommended approach to taking this course so you can get the best value from it. First off, you should watch the videos. And if something is not clear or apparent at first, feel free to watch that video again. And if you find that I'm going too fast or too slow, this video player also has a playback speed control. Make use of that and adjust the speed to your liking. So if you find my pace too slow, you can speed me up by up to two times. And if you find that I'm going too fast, you can slow me down as well using the same playback speed control. I also highly encourage you to code along or build along with me. Do write the code, try out the demos, test out the examples that I show you, and this will only help solidify your understanding of the ideas and concepts more effectively than simply watching the videos. Also, be mindful of AWS pricing if you're experimenting a lot. However, overall, most of the demos that I show you in this course will be well within the free tier, but a subset of them may not be free. So do check the current pricing on the AWS website. And occasionally there could be times when you need help or need more information. And to help you out in these situations, I provide some resources like source code files, solutions, as well as additional reference links. You'll find these attached to various lectures and uh, you can certainly download these and compare my solution with yours. And if you still are stuck or have some other queries or questions related to the course, please do not hesitate to ask them. Ask in the Q&A section and I'm always here to help you and to guide you. Also, help other students if you can participate in the Q&A section, open up new discussions and get the ball rolling. That's about it. There are some background topics, specifically JSON, YAML, Node.js, JavaScript, and you may want to review them before we dive into the main serverless topics. I have created two optional sections for those of you who are new to these topics. These optional sections are included at the end of this course. If you're already familiar with these topics, feel free to skip them. If you're new to these topics though, then I highly recommend going through those optional sections before you start with the next section. These optional sections, as I said, are available at the end of this course. That's all for right now. And let's finally dive in and get the ball rolling. We already covered what serverless computing is and I also introduced you to AWS Lambda in the very first section of this course where we created our first serverless function using Lambda. Just to summarize, serverless computing is a cloud computing execution model in which uh, the cloud provider dynamically manages the allocation of uh, infrastructure resources. So we don't have to worry about managing servers or any of the infrastructure. And AWS Lambda is an event-driven serverless computing platform or a compute service provided by AWS. The code that we run on AWS Lambda is called as a Lambda function. And 
as we saw in the hands-on lab we did in the last section, we can simply write these lambda functions right inside the lambda console or as we'll see in this section, we can also write them locally on our computer and upload them to Lambda. Later in this course, we'll also learn how to streamline this development process using frameworks like SAM, the AWS serverless application model, or by using the serverless framework. Once the code is deployed to Lambda, it's ready to run and it runs whenever it is triggered by a pre-configured event source. Lambda functions can be triggered by a numerous event sources like API gateway calls, S3 file uploads, changes to DynamoDB table data, CloudWatch events, SNS notifications, third-party APIs, IoT devices, and so on. And we're going to look at many of these examples in detail in the demo sections towards the end of this course. The Lambda functions run in containerized environments which spring into action only when triggered by an event source. So no resources are consumed and therefore there is no billing for the idle time. We are charged only for the time our Lambda functions run and billing is done in increments of 100 milliseconds of the compute time. So if Lambda function runs for say 90 milliseconds, we would be billed for just about 100 milliseconds, while if it runs for say 200 milliseconds, then we'll be billed for that 200 milliseconds. And about 1 million requests per month are free. So in short, AWS Lambda is very low cost and does not require any upfront investment. We'll look at the pricing of AWS Lambda in uh, detail later in the section. That said, let's continue to the next lecture and we'll do a quick walkthrough of the AWS Lambda console. Welcome back. In this lecture, let's do a quick walkthrough of the AWS Lambda console. I have the Lambda console open here and you can see the get random message function that we created in the last section. If you click on this box with the function name, you will see the function code here. This is the function code and you can either edit it in line or upload a zip file or you can upload the same zip file to S3 and then upload it uh, from S3 using this option. We're going to look at this a little later. Then we have runtime. There are various runtimes that are available, C Sharp or .NET Core. Google Go, Java, Node.js, and Python. We're going to use the Node.js 8.10 runtime throughout this course as it's the latest Node.js runtime available as of now. Handler is index.handler, which means the function with name handler located inside index.js file. As you scroll down, you will see environment variables, here you can add key value pairs that the function code needs at the runtime. So you can add environment uh, specific constants or API keys here and then you can access them inside your code. If the values of these environment variables are sensitive, then uh, you can also explicitly encrypt them using this KMS service. And if you do so, you will also need to decrypt them within your function code. And we're going to dive into this later in the course. Then we have tags. Tags can be used to group and filter your functions. These are case sensitive key value pairs. Execution role is the Lambda execution role that we added previously. You can make changes to the role here if needed. You can choose another role or create a new role from templates or create a custom role using IAM. Then we have basic settings. You can add a function description if you like. You can also adjust the max memory that your function requires. And it's worth mentioning here that the CPU resources allocated to the function are always in proportion to the memory size that we choose here. You can choose memory from 128 MB 
all the way up to 3008 MB. And then you can set timeout in seconds. You can set this value anywhere from one second to up to 15 minutes. So maximum amount of time any Lambda function can run is about 15 minutes. This was earlier limited to five minutes. Now AWS Lambda allows us to run functions up to 15 minutes. Timeout is one of the essential considerations when building serverless apps. Ideally, your Lambda functions should be designed to perform single specific task and not perform several tasks. You can segregate your application logic in multiple Lambda functions, each performing one single specific task. This approach is often used in microservices architectures and such microservices based architectures are best suited for serverless applications. Then we have VPC settings under the network section. Here you can attach your Lambda function to a VPC. You can simply choose your VPC and add desired subnets, at least two of them and select the VPC security group here. When you attach a Lambda function to a VPC, the function will run within that VPC and will have access only to the resources inside the VPC. That means it will lose access to the resources outside the VPC. It will also lose access to the internet. And in case it requires the internet access, you need to open appropriate outbound connections in the selected security group. And the VPC would also require a NAT gateway in that case. We're going to look at uh, running Lambda functions within VPC later in this course. Then here you can define DL queues or dead letter queues. These are useful when Lambda function ends up in errors even after multiple retries. So if a Lambda function errors out, Lambda can send this event payload either to an SQS queue or as an SNS notification. We'll be learning how to use DL queues later in this course, of course. Then we have concurrency limits here we define the maximum number of concurrent executions possible for your Lambda function. All AWS accounts receive a concurrency limit of 1000 and this is applied across the Lambda functions in your AWS account. If you reserve concurrency limit for a particular function, then the remaining concurrency limit will be shared by other Lambda functions present in your account. So if you reserve 500 concurrent executions, say for this function, then the other 500 will be available to remaining Lambda functions. And if you reserve 900, then only 100 will be available to the other remaining Lambda functions. And finally, auditing and compliance can be set up using AWS CloudTrail service, and it allows you to log the functions invocations inside CloudTrail if your organization requires that for auditing and compliance purposes. Then we have test options in the top right corner. You can use the drop down to configure test events. Simply select configure test events option and you can add your event here. Save it and then use it for testing just like we did earlier. Under Actions menu, we have options to create versions and aliases. We'll deep dive into this later in the course. You can also delete or export your functions using these options here. If you click on Export, you will be able to download the function code as an AWS SAM file or as a zip file using this Download Deployment Package option. We'll learn about AWS SAM later in the course. Under qualifiers, you can choose the versions and aliases. The throttle option can be used to throttle your Lambda function, and you can use this in emergency purpose. Then we have monitoring tab that allows us to monitor the function at runtime. You can click through to CloudWatch or X-ray services to view the logs and traces in detail from here. That's more or less all about the Lambda console.
let's talk about permission model in the very next lecture AWS Lambda uses a decoupled permission model. The service or event that triggers the Lambda function only requires the necessary permissions to invoke the Lambda function. Here you will see different triggers on the left. We have API gateway event trigger added to this function. If you click on this box, you will be able to see and edit the trigger configuration below. And you can add more triggers from the left side. There are several event triggers that can trigger a Lambda function and you can see them listed here. When you add an event trigger to your Lambda function, it's automatically assigned an appropriate IAM policy to invoke this Lambda function. This role is called as Lambda Invocation Policy or Function Policy. On the right, you will see the list of services our Lambda function has access to. Clicking on the box will show you the specific resources and actions that this function's code has access to. These permissions are called as Lambda execution role. And if you click on the key icon here, you will be able to view the invocation or function policy as well as the execution role assigned to this function. So in effect, there are two sets of IAM permissions applied here. The invocation permissions via the function policy and execution permissions via the execution role. The function policy is used by the triggering event or the service to invoke the Lambda function while the execution role is used by the Lambda function to access different AWS services that it depends on. The function policy and execution role are independent of each other. Different event sources that trigger the Lambda function are not required to have the permissions that the Lambda function code requires to complete its job. Thus, the two are effectively decoupled thereby improving our application security. That said, let's continue to the next lecture where we'll take a closer look at the Lambda handler function. When we wrote our first Lambda function, we made use of the Cloud9 editor or the web-based editor integrated into the Lambda console. Now let me show you how we can write these functions locally on our computer and then upload them to Lambda. We'll also take a closer look at the Lambda handler function as we write our function. So I'm going to create a new folder here. Let's say greet me. And inside this we'll create a simple Lambda function that takes in our name and language and greets us a hello in the chosen language. Before we do that, let's take a look at uh, Lambda syntax in Node.js 6.10 and Node.js 8.10. Let's open this folder with VS Code or you can open it with any code editor or IDE of your choice. We'll create a new file, say index.js. And inside it, let's write the Lambda handler. Exports.handler equal to event, context, and a callback. And inside the function handler, we write our code. And finally, we make a call to the callback function, like so. This is node 6.10 style or the callback style handler function. We can easily write the same handler using async await syntax that's supported by the latest uh, node 8.10 runtime. So let's look at the syntax for async await based Lambda handler. I'll copy this code, comment it out and paste it below so we can change it. 
we simply add async before the function and we won't have a callback argument in this case. So we remove it and instead of calling the callback, we simply return the result using return statement, just like so. And now, since this is an async function, you can use the await operator to wait for any promises to resolve. So let's say I remove this and let's define another function. Say we want to resize images. So we write a function that returns a promise, constant resize image equal to some data, fat array function that returns a new promise that can either resolve or reject. And inside this, we have some processing. And finally, if there's an error, we reject the promise with the error. Otherwise, we resolve it with the result. This is a typical uh, function that returns a promise and we can call it inside our Lambda handler. So constant data equal to event dot data. And then we can call resize image function followed by a then block. But since our Lambda handler is declared as an async function, we can make use of the await operator. So we can simply say let new image equal to await resize image. And finally, we can return new image. This is how we can write Lambda handler using the async await syntax. This syntax is only supported in Node.js runtime 8.10 and above. And we'll be using this syntax throughout this course for all the demos. Irrespective of the type of handler you use, whether callback style or async await style, there are two important arguments to the function handler, event and context. The event object is dependent on the event source. So the structure of this event object varies from uh, event to event and it acts as a source of input data for our Lambda handler. And context is what sets the general environment for our Lambda function. So you can use the context object to retrieve information about the context in which the function executes, like the function name, remaining time, memory limit, and other additional information. So I'll clean this up and let's continue to the next lecture. In the next few lectures, we'll look at the event and context objects in more detail. In the last lecture, we saw that a Lambda function can have two arguments, event and context. In this lecture, let's understand the event object in little more detail. The event object holds the input data or input parameters that we want the Lambda function to act on. The structure of this event object depends on the event source. We have these different event triggers that can be used to invoke our Lambda functions. And each of these triggers will send the event data in a particular structure as we'll see in this lecture. Lambda supports two invocation types, synchronous and asynchronous. The invocation type, whether synchronous or asynchronous, depends on the event source. For example, an S3 event is always asynchronous, while an API gateway or Cognito event will be synchronous. And we cannot control this. However, in cases where we invoke the Lambda function through our own application using the invoke method of the AWS SDK, for example, we can choose the invocation type, either synchronous or asynchronous. Then we have two types of event sources, push-based events and pull-based or poll-based events. 
push-based events push the event data to Lambda in order to invoke the function. On the other hand, in case of pull events or poll-based events, Lambda polls the event stream to look for the event data. Example of push event is an S3 event or an API gateway event. Example of pull or poll based events is DynamoDB stream event, a Kinesis stream event, or an Amazon SQS queue event. In this type of event, Lambda pulls event data from the DynamoDB, Kinesis, or SQS and invokes the Lambda function. Now let's look at sample event data for few events. Let's select the option to configure event data from this drop down. Choose create new test event. And here we have several event templates. Let's select one. Say API Gateway AWS Proxy. It has a typical structure. We have HTTP body of the message. This is HTTP post method and it has its body and all other different parameters. It has some query string parameters and then it also has the path parameters just like a typical HTTP request. Then if we switch to another event type, let's say DynamoDB update event, we can see the structure presented by a DynamoDB stream event. Whenever we add, modify, or delete items in the DynamoDB table, DynamoDB can push event data to DynamoDB streams, which can then be polled by Lambda. So this event has the DynamoDB table item keys, the new image, that holds the item data that was inserted or modified. This is an insert event, which means uh, this item was added to DynamoDB table. Further, we have another item that holds uh, old image and a new image. This is a modify event, which indicates that the item was modified. The old image is the item data before modification and new image is the same item data after modification. And finally, we have a remove event that indicates an item was deleted from the table. And in this case, we'll have only the old image of the item data. So we can see that each event source will have its own predefined event data structure and we write our Lambda function according to the event or events that it needs to process. If we are invoking the Lambda function from our code using AWS SDK, for example, we can have our own custom event structure. In the next lecture, let's look at the context object, which is the second parameter to the Lambda handler. In the last lecture, we looked at event object, which is the first parameter to any Lambda function handler. Lambda handler also has an optional second argument called the context object. Let's understand what all we can do with this context object. The context object provides us with some useful runtime information while the Lambda function is executing. For example, we can use the context object to find out how much time is remaining before the Lambda function times out, what CloudWatch log group or log stream is associated with the Lambda function, what is the AWS request ID of the current invocation of this Lambda function and so on. This context object provides different methods and properties which we can use to get this runtime information. So if we write context dot get remaining time in millis, this is going to give us the time remaining in milliseconds before the Lambda function times out. This is a method. We also have different uh, properties. 
So for example, context dot function name will give us the name of the lambda function. We can use this to invoke the same lambda function again programmatically using the AWS SDK, for example. Then we have context dot function version that returns the version of the currently executing lambda function. Context dot function arn will give us the arn of the currently running lambda function. Context dot AWS request ID will give us the request ID of the current invocation. We can use this request ID for any follow-up inquiry with AWS support if we need to. Context dot memory limit in MB will give us the memory size allocated to this function. Context dot identity will give us information about the Cognito identity provider if we're using that. This is useful with the AWS mobile SDK. Context dot log group name and Context dot log stream name will uh, give us the names of the log group and log stream associated with our lambda function. If we are using AWS mobile SDK, we can have context dot client context and this property can give us additional information about the client application and client device. For example, we could have client context dot client dot installation ID or app title. We could also have client context dot custom to access custom values set by the mobile application, for example. We can access environment variables with env.platform version or make or model and so on. And I have also added the link to the context object documentation. You can find this link in the resources section of this lecture. That's more or less all about the context object. In the next lecture, let's explore how to perform logging and error handling from within the Lambda functions. Now, let's quickly look at error handling and logging in this lecture. First, the error handling. If you're using callback style Lambda handler like so, then you can throw errors using the first argument to the callback function. So we could have constant error equal to new error and error occurred. And you can pass the error as the first argument to the callback function. And if you're using the async await type lambda handler, then you can simply throw an error using a throw statement like so. And of course, you can wrap your code within a try catch block for better error handling. If you want to print the error message to the console, you can use console.error like so. Similarly, we could have console.log like so to output a log message or console.info for informative message. And also console.warn to print a warning message, for example. This is more of a Node.js or JavaScript syntax, nothing specific to Lambda, and we can use it for error handling and logging. And these messages printed to the console will get logged automatically to the AWS CloudWatch service. Let me show you what I mean. Let me copy this and I'll paste it into our Lambda function code on the AWS Lambda console here and save it just for the sake of testing. And then let's test this out using the test button. 
and we can see the messages printed to the console here and if we scroll up we can find them in the log output as well and we can access these messages only when we use the test button AWS also writes the Lambda console output to CloudWatch. So in real world situation where we don't have direct access to the console, we can access these logs via the CloudWatch service. If we click on this logs link, it will take us to CloudWatch. And we should see the same messages logged there. Let's pick up this latest log stream and we can already see these messages logged here. And if we go back to the Lambda console and I close this and also close this terminal window, if we wanted to output this dynamic message to the console, for example, we could do that as well. So instead of this string, we can log this message variable. I'll remove rest of the code. Save that. And if we test this, it's going to print a random message to the console. Hello serverless. And it should also show up in CloudWatch. So we go back to the log streams and click on the latest stream it's not showing up all the output yet and it takes a few seconds to show up so let's wait for one or two seconds and then we'll refresh this and now we can see hello serverless message here logged to the crowdwatch service now instead of logging a message let's throw an error we can do that using the throw statement, like so. Let's say this is a random error. I'll save that. And this line of code is, of course, not reachable now, but that should be fine for our testing. So let's test this out. And we can see the error output on the console. And it will also show up at the top of the screen here. Let's go to CloudWatch and look at the latest log stream. And we can already see the error message showing up here. That's about it. This is how we can use error handling and logging with the Lambda function. And since this was just for our demo and testing, before we continue further, I'll remove the throw statement and save it. And if you test it now, it should work normally. Shooting for the stars. Wow, amazing. We got to shoot for the stars as well. All right, let's keep going. We'll do a quick hands-on lab in the very next lecture. In this lecture, let's do a quick hands-on lab. We started with greet me lambda function earlier. So let's complete that now. I have the function open in VS Code. Basically, it's just a blank file named index.js inside a folder named greet me. What we are going to create here is a multilingual greeting function. So we pass in person's name and a language choice and the function will return a greeting in the chosen language. Just an extension of plain hello world function. So let's begin. We'll declare a constant, say greeting. This would be an object. Uh, it will have different language keys with corresponding greetings. So in English, we say hello. In French, they say bonjour. In Hindi, we say namaste. And then I'm going to paste in some greetings in more languages here. 
you can certainly get more creative here we'll keep this simple for easy understanding the now we have greetings in a couple of languages here so let's go ahead and write the lambda handler shall we exports dot handler equal to async event we don't need the context object here so we can drop that one and inside the curly brackets we can write the handler function code this function is expecting to receive path parameters as part of uh, HTTP GET request coming in from Amazon API Gateway and we'll use query parameters as well. A path parameter is mandatory parameter on an HTTP request while the query string parameter by convention is optional. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go to the API Gateway console for a moment. We'll be creating a greet me API endpoint right inside this hello world API. Let's go to the stages and then to the test stage and open this invoke URL in a new tab. We could have our endpoint like so. Say greet me followed by name. So I'll put in my name Riaz. For example and this name here acts as a path parameter because it's part of the URL path and we could have any number of path parameters separated by slashes like so. We'll stick to one to keep it simple and then we add a question mark any key value pairs that we specify after this question mark are called as query parameters say param equal to value and we can add multiple key value pairs here separated by an ampersand character like so so this one is going to be part of the path parameters while these two will be the query parameters and all these parameters will be available in the event object that gets passed to our lambda handler and before we create our endpoint in api gateway let's build our lambda function first so i'll close this for now let's continue writing our lambda handler in the very next lecture back into the vs code let's continue writing our lambda handler Inside the Lambda handler, we have to capture the path and query string parameters from the event object. The name of our path parameter is name. So let's say let name equal to event dot path parameters dot name, for example. And path parameters is a predefined attribute of the API Gateway AWS Proxy event. And if we go back to AWS console for a moment and open up Lambda console, let's open any one of the functions here and open up a test event, create new test event. And let's select the event template for API Gateway AWS Proxy. We can see that we have an attribute named query string parameters here. And we also have path parameters attribute here. So we should be using exactly the same structure and attribute names to access these parameters in our Lambda handler. So back in VS Code, we can use query parameters to capture the language key and by using query parameter for language key we are essentially making this parameter optional and since the end user can pass in any number of query parameters i'm going to use destructuring here so we can capture language in variable lang 
again if there are any additional parameters passed in by the user we can capture them in the info variable so i specify it with triple dots equal to event dot query string parameters just like that so language will go into the variable lang and rest of the query string parameters will go into the info variable then we can use these parameters to construct our greeting message so let message equal to and i'll use template strings here inside it we could say dollar curly braces and we'll use the greeting for the language key passed in the query string parameter. We first check if we have a greeting for the chosen language. If we do, we use it. Else we'll use a default greeting in English as a fallback. Then we add a single space followed by the name passed in by the user. So if we choose English and pass the name as Riyadh, it should generate a message, hello Riyadh. And that's about it. Finally, we have to return an HTTP response back to the API gateway. So we construct a response object. Let response equal to object message colon message. And we could also return info colon info to display the additional query string parameters that were passed in by the end user. And let's also add a timestamp just for the sake of demonstration. I'm going to use the moment library to get the timestamp. So before we can use it, we need to install the moment npm module. So let's open the terminal. I'll first create a package.json file using npm init. I'll accept the defaults by hitting enter key multiple times. And this should create a package.json file for us. And now we'll install the moment library using npm install moment with a save flag. Back to our code, we can now reference the moment library. Like so. And then we can get the Unix timestamp using moment.unix. Finally, we just have to return this response. So we could simply say return response, just like that. However, in this case, we are using API Gateway Proxy. So, API Gateway expects the Lambda function to return well-formed HTTP response instead of just the data or just the response body. We have to return an HTTP response object that has a status code and body at the bare minimum. So we could say status code as 200, which indicates success. And we can return our response object in the HTTP response body as a JSON string using json.stringify response. Save the file and that's about it. Let's deploy this function to AWS Lambda in the very next lecture. To deploy the Lambda function we just created, we simply have to zip these files together and upload it to AWS Lambda. We could upload it using the command line or using the web-based AWS Lambda console. For now, we'll upload it using the web-based console. Later on, I'll show you how you can use the command line or terminal to do the same thing. And later in the course, we're also going to learn more streamlined approach of using frameworks like AWS SAM and the serverless framework to deploy our code.
For now, as we have just started learning serverless and Lambda, let's use the simple web-based interface to upload our code. So we simply go to the folder that contains our Lambda function code, open the folder and select all the files and create a zip file out of it. I'll name it greetme.zip and I'll copy this path here. And now we can open the Lambda console and we'll create a new function. Let's name it greet me. We'll use the Node.js 8.10 runtime and we'll use the same role that we used the last time, the basic execution role. Create the function and our function is ready. There is no trigger here yet. Later on, we'll add API gateway as a trigger. So in here, we select the option to upload a zip file. We can also upload the zip file from S3. So in case our file is larger, say over 10 MB or so, we can upload it to S3 first and then specify the S3 URL path to that file here. Since our zip file is pretty small, we'll upload it directly. So let's select the option to upload it directly and upload our file. And hit save. The file has been uploaded here and if we scroll down, we should be able to see our code. We can access all the files from the left. We also have our node modules folder with the moment library inside it. So let's test this function now. We need to create a test event first. We'll select the API gateway AWS proxy event. This is a sample event template. We'll modify the path and query string parameters. Our Lambda function expects name as the path parameter. So I'll add my name Riaz as name. And in query string parameters, we'll pass the language as lang. Let's say hi for Hindi, for example. So the function should return Namaste Riyaz, which means Hello Riyaz in Hindi language. I'm also going to add a few additional parameters. We could say city as Mumbai, country as India, website for example is academy.rismax.com. We also have to give a name to our event. Let's say greet me event. It doesn't like spaces, so I'll remove it and hit create. Now we are ready to test. So let's click on test. And we see Namaste Riyaz as the message since we chose Hindi as the language and Rest of the parameters like city, country, website are also included in the info attribute. And we also have the timestamp here. Now, if we go back to the test event and change the language from Hindi to say XX, something non-existent, it should fall back to the default English message. And now it says, Hello Riaz in English as expected. And if we choose, let's say Spanish, it says Hola Riaz, awesome. Later in this course, we'll integrate this function with API gateway so we can trigger the function via an HTTP call. Before we do that, let's play around a little bit more with Lambda. We'll do some more hands-on with Lambda in the next lecture.
So let's continue to it. In this lecture, let's create a lambda function that can resize images on the fly in a serverless fashion, of course. Let's open the lambda console and we'll create a new function. Let's name the function as resize images. We'll use Node.js 8.10 runtime and we'll create a new custom row. This will take us to IAM. And in here, I'm going to create a new role. Let's say Lambda S3 execution. This policy currently provides only CloudWatch permissions and we're gonna change that in a bit. For now, click allow. And then hit create function. We can now go back to IAM and update the role permissions. I'll open it in a new tab and we'll edit the role. Search for Lambda S3 and this is the role we want to edit. We'll attach a policy to it. Search for S3. We'll use S3 full access. You can use more restrictive policy if you like, but I'm going to use uh, S3 full access just to keep it simple. That's about it. We close this tab and go back to Lambda. And if we refresh the page, we should see the S3 access showing up on the right. Now we have to write the Lambda handler and we're going to do that locally on our computer. We then use AWS CLI to deploy the code to Lambda. Before we do that, I'll increase the timeout of the function a bit let's say about two minutes, just to be on the safer side. Save the function. Now to write the handler code, I'm going to create a new folder with the same name as our Lambda function. Resize images. And I have a few images here with me. These are fairly large images. We are going to resize them and make them smaller. All right. Let's open this folder in VS Code. And in here, I'll create a new file. Let's say index.js. We're going to need a few libraries for image processing as well as for file IO. We'll use image magic for image processing. So constant im equal to require image magic. Note the spelling. And then we have constant fs equal to require fs. Constant os equal to require os. Constant uui day v4 equal to require UUID slash V4. And then we're going to need one more utility here. I'm going to use object destructuring. Inside curly braces, we write promisify equal to require util. And finally, we also need the AWS SDK. So constant AWS equal to require AWS SDK followed by aws.config.update region as US West 2. You can set this region as per your case. I'm using US West 2 as my Lambda function is in the region US West 2. We'll also define constant S3 equal to new AWS dot S3 in uppercase. And note that all these NPM modules are actually part of the AWS Lambda Node.js environment. 
So we don't have to package them in our deployment zip file. So let's write our Lambda handler exports dot handler equal to async event followed by a fat arrow function. Before we write the handler code, let's go back to the Lambda console for a moment. Open the test event and I'm going to look for S3 put event template. It's here. In this event, we can see that we have a records array and within that we have an S3 attribute which has an object and inside it we have the key. The key holds the name of the uploaded file. We also have the bucket name here. So we can access the file name using record.s3.object.key and similarly bucket name via record.s3.bucket.name. These are the values we are going to need in our function. So whenever a new file is uploaded or put into this S3 bucket, our Lambda function would trigger and the event object will give us the file name and the bucket name. We can then use this information to access the image and resize it. So back to our code in VS Code. There can be more than one files added to S3 simultaneously. So we write event.records.map and inside it we we'll write a function that takes in each record and processes it. We'll make this function async. And once all the files have been processed, we can return the control back from the Lambda handler. So we could say let files processed equal to this and then we'll await for all the promises to resolve using promise.all and pass files processed variable to it just like that. Finally we can console log done and also return done for example. The only part that's remaining now is writing the map handler function. Let's do that in the very next lecture. We wrote a part of our lambda function in the last lecture. Let's complete rest of the function in this lecture. So inside the lambda handler we have the map handler function. It's currently empty. Let's complete it. We first capture the names of the S3 bucket and image file from the event object. So let bucket equal to and if we go back to Lambda, we can see that it's located in S3 object bucket and the file name is located in S3 object key. So we should say record dot S3 dot bucket dot name and similarly file name equal to record dot s3 dot object dot key just like that. Then we have to do a couple of things. First we get the file from s3 then we resize the file we read the resized file And finally, we upload the new resized file to S3 in the destination bucket. That's all we need to do. So first, let's get the file from S3. We'll declare a params object with a bucket as bucket and key as the file name. Then we can say s3.get object params and if you like you can also use a callback here like so but since we are using async await syntax we can convert this function to a promise 
using dot promise like so and then we can either use then like so or use await we'll use await as it makes the code very simple to read and understand let's capture it into say input data now that we got the image from s3 we have to resize it using the image magic library the image magic library doesn't have direct support for promises so what we're going to do is we're going to use a library called promiseify that we declared earlier so let's go back up and here i'm going to declare a constant say resize async equal to promiseify i am dot resize what this is going to do is it will convert the callback style resize function into a function that returns us a promise so we can use it with async await syntax let's declare a variable say temp y equal to os dot tmp dir this will give us access to the temp directory on the lambda container environment followed by slash followed by uuid v4 function followed by dot jpg this is going to generate a unique name for our target image file then let's create an object resize args for example and we'll add a couple of attributes to it like src data for source data and pass the body from the input data file we got from s3 followed by dst path or destination path which will be the temp file and we also need to specify the width of the resized image so let's say 150 this will create an image a resized image about 150 pixels wide and if you like, you can review the image magic documentation to understand different parameters that we can pass here. And then we call the resize function with await resize async and we'll pass resize args object to it. This is going to generate a resized image file and place it in the destination path that we specified, that is the temp file. We can then access the resized file from the temp file path and we'll use the read file function from the fs library to do that. The fs read file function also uses the callback style so we have to convert it to return a promise using promiseify. So I'll quickly do that. Constant read file async equal to promiseify fs dot read file and we'll also need to unlink the temp file once we are done using it so we'll write constant unlink async equal to promiseify fs dot unlink just like that now to read the file we can say let resize data equal to await read file async temp file and now that we have the resized file we can upload it to s3 to do that we can say let target file name equal to and we can use the same file name as the original image file and maybe modify it a bit We'll first strip the extension from the file name using substring like so. Then we can append, let's say, dash small dot jpg, for example. Then to upload this file to S3, we declare a params object. We have to pass the bucket name 
we'll use the original bucket name concatenated with say dash dest for example we'll also have to create this bucket in s3 we'll do that shortly we'll then add a key which will be same as the target file name followed by the body this would hold the content of the resized image so we can pass a new buffer with the resized data to it we also provide a content type which in our case will be image slash jpeg that's about it finally we can upload the file to s3 using s3 dot put object params convert it to a promise and then we await for the upload to complete once that's done we can return the call after unlinking the temp file so we can write return await unlink async and pass the temp file to it and we are done once all the files are processed the lambda handler would return done this is a single file and there are no external dependencies so we could simply copy and paste this file in the lambda code editor but i want to show you how to deploy lambda functions using aws cli that's just another way of doing things so let's continue to the next lecture Before we can test our image resizing lambda function, we must create the source and destination buckets. So let's open S3. I'll open it in a new tab. I'll create a new bucket. Bucket names must be unique globally. So I'll add my name to it, say Riaz images, for example and we can just hit create then we'll create a destination bucket and we use the same name followed by dash dest hit create so we have two buckets created let's open these two buckets this is the source bucket. We have to configure the source bucket such that it triggers our Lambda function whenever a new file is added to it. To do that, we go to the bucket properties, scroll down and look for events. Click on that and we'll add a new notification. let's name it resize image notification for example and we'll be looking for put event so whenever a new file is put into this bucket this event will be fired we can add file path prefix and suffix here to filter the files if we like so we can add say dot jpg as a suffix so this event will be fired only when a jpg image is put into this bucket for destination we choose aws lambda and then we can select our resize images lambda function from here save the configuration and we have an active notification That's about it. In the next lecture, let's deploy our Lambda function so we can test it. In this lecture, let's explore how to use AWS CLI to deploy a Lambda function. To complete this lab, you will need to have AWS CLI installed on your computer. So if you haven't already done that, Please review the AWS CLI setup video from the very first section of this course. 
Assuming that you have the AWS CLI installed, let's continue. I'm going to open the resize images folder that holds our Lambda handler code. We just have to zip the contents of this folder. So I'll zip this index.js file and name it as resize images, for example. Back in VS Code, we can see the zip file right here. Open the terminal. First, we have to upload the zip file to S3. So we say AWS S3 CP to copy this file. File name is resize-images.zip. Destination is s3 colon slash slash, followed by the bucket name. I'm going to use the same source bucket that we created in the last lecture, rias-images. This is not going to trigger our Lambda function because this is not a JPG file, but a zip file. So we should be good with that. And then we specify the same name for the target file. Hit enter. This should upload the file to S3 and it did. And now we have the file uploaded to S3. We can deploy that to Lambda. I'll just expand this a bit. We already have the Lambda function created earlier. So we simply update the Lambda function code. To do that, we say AWS Lambda update dash function dash code followed by dash dash function dash name. Our function name is resize images then we have to specify the S3 bucket. Bucket name in my case is rias-images and S3 key will be the name of the file which is resize-images.zip and then we say dash dash publish. This is all we need. Hit enter and there you go. We have our function deployed to AWS Lambda. If we refresh the Lambda console now, we should see our new code here. Awesome. And for some reason, if you aren't able to see your new code, make sure you have selected the latest version of the Lambda function from here. We're now ready to test our Lambda function with S3 trigger. Why don't we do that in the very next lecture? To test the S3 trigger for our Lambda function, what we have to do is simply upload the JPG image file to the source S3 bucket. So I have the source S3 bucket here and I'm going to upload two images to this bucket. Select these two image files and simply drag them over here and upload. And hopefully once these files are uploaded, it should trigger our Lambda function, which in turn should create two resized images in the destination S3 bucket. So now that our files have been uploaded to the source bucket, let's go to the destination bucket and refresh to see if we have some images there and we don't see them here so I must have goofed up something. Let's find out what went wrong. Let's go back to the Lambda console and choose monitoring. We do have an invocation so our Lambda function was indeed triggered by the S3 upload so there might be some other issue. Let's go to the CloudWatch logs to find out what that could be. Open the log stream. And it says the specified bucket does not exist. All right, 
if we look at the source bucket it's rias dash images and the destination bucket is rias dash image dash dest ah so this is where i goofed up the destination bucket should have been rias dash images dash test and not rias dash image i missed an s in here our lambda function is actually looking for a bucket name with name same as the source bucket but concatenated with dash test so let's go back here and we can drop this bucket and create a new one with the correct name so i'm going to select this bucket and delete it type the bucket name and confirm delete and then let's create a new bucket with the correct name this time rias dash images dash test that's what i should have done in the first place never mind that allowed me to show you how to debug our lambda code so that's a good thing so now our bucket is created let's test the function by uploading the image files again i'm going to delete these images first now let's upload them once again and this time i hope it works just fine so let's refresh the destination bucket and we do see two images lambda blue small dot jpg and lambda orange small dot jpg awesome let's download these two files and open them and these are the two resized images if we look at the original images these are large ones as compared to the resized ones. Let's also look at the CloudWatch logs. Refresh, open the stream, and we do see done logged in here two times. So the Lambda was triggered twice, once for each file. Awesome. Before we end this lecture, let's quickly look at the S3 trigger in the Lambda console, click on configuration. And if we click on the S3 trigger here, it would show us the trigger configuration. And you can enable or disable the trigger from here. So I'll just disable this trigger as we are done with this demo example. Save that. That's the end of this hands-on lab. Hope you found it useful. In the next lecture, let's continue exploring Lambda a bit more. There are certain limits that AWS imposes on our use of Lambda service, like the maximum timeout or max memory limit or size of our deployment package and so on. Let's explore what some of these limits are in this lecture. For a complete list of limits, I have added a link to Lambda Limits documentation page. You can find the link in the resources section of this lecture. First, let's take a look at the function limits. Each function can be allocated with memory size between 128 MB to 3008 MB in 64 MB increments. Other resources are allocated based on the memory size we choose here. Then every function we write gets a default ephemeral disk capacity of up to 512 MB. This is the temporary storage space or slash TMP directory space allocated to the function. And if you remember, we did make use of this in the last hands-on lab where we created a Lambda function to resize images. Each Lambda function can run up to a maximum of 900 seconds, which is about 15 minutes. 
This limit was five minutes previously. Now AWS allows a maximum timeout of about 15 minutes. There are also size limits on the request and response body payload size. For synchronous uh, invocations like in API Gateway, this limit is up to 6 MB. For asynchronous invocation, the request body payload size is about 128 KB. Then there are limits on the size of deployment package that we upload to Lambda. The maximum package size is about 50 MB when compressed into a zip file and about 250 MB when uncompressed. And if your deployment package size is under 3 MB, you can edit it in the online cloud-based editor available in the Lambda console. Total size of all the packages within uh, a given region is limited to about 75 GB. Finally, there are concurrency limits at per account level. Up to 1000 concurrent Lambda executions are allowed per region across all Lambda functions within that region. You can have this limit increased by contacting the AWS support. You can reserve concurrency limit at the Lambda function level as long as it is within this maximum limit. Also remember that when you reserve concurrency limit for any function, then the other functions can only use the balance limit that is unreserved. All these limit values are current as of recording this video, that's October of 2018. These might change in future and it's a good idea to check the actual limits on the AWS website. I have included a direct link to it in the resources section of this lecture. That's about it. In the next lecture, let's look at Lambda pricing model. In this lecture, let's discuss AWS Lambda pricing. AWS Lambda offers sub-second billing and we are charged only for the time it takes for our Lambda code to execute. Lambda uses very simple pricing model. There are two parts to Lambda pricing, the number of requests and the duration of each request in GB seconds. One request is one invocation of any Lambda function in our AWS account. Up to 1 million requests per month are free and up to 400,000 GB seconds of compute time per month is free as well. AWS will charge us only if our usage goes beyond this free tier. Beyond the free tier, AWS charges just about 20 cents per 1 million requests and beyond 400,000 GB seconds of free compute time, it charges us something like $0.00001667 per GB second as of recording this video, of course, and this might change in future. So you should always check the current pricing on the AWS website. The total bill is the sum of the request charges and the compute charges. Let's quickly look at a simple example. Let's say we have two Lambda functions in our account. One function has 128 MB allocated and it executed 2 million times in a month and ran for let's say 200 milliseconds each time. Another function has about 512 MB allocated memory and it executed about 3 million times in a month and ran for 300 milliseconds each time. So the total number of billable requests will be 2 million plus 3 million minus 1 million free requests, which comes to about 4 million requests. So Request charges will be 4 million into 0.2 US dollars per million, which is 0.8 US dollars or just about 80 cents. Similarly, to calculate the compute time, we first calculate the compute seconds. 
for the first function the compute seconds will be 2 million into 0.2 seconds which is equivalent of 200 milliseconds which comes to around 0.4 million seconds similarly compute seconds for the second function will be 3 million into 0.3 seconds which is equivalent of 300 milliseconds and this comes to about 0.9 million seconds lambda first normalizes the total compute time to gb seconds and then sums the total across all the functions so compute time in gb seconds for the first function will be 0.4 million seconds into 128 by 1024 which comes to about 50000 gb seconds Similarly, for the second function, this will be 0.9 million seconds into 512 by 1024, which comes to about 450,000 GB seconds. So, the total compute usage is 50,000 plus 450,000, which comes to about 500,000 GB seconds. Out of these, 400,000 GB seconds are free. So chargeable compute time will be 500,000 minus 400,000, which is about 100,000 GB seconds. So the total compute charges will be 100,000 into 0 0.00001667, which is about 1.67 US dollars. The total charges for the month would be sum of the request and the compute charges that is 0.8 plus 1.67 which is just about 2.47 US dollars per month. I hope this gives you an idea of how AWS Lambda pricing model works and for learning purposes this is virtually free to use as we are unlikely to exceed the free tier while testing unless you are testing extensively. So that's about it on Lambda pricing and with that we also come to the end of this introductory section on AWS Lambda. We're going to dive much deeper into the specifics of Lambda in the later sections of this course. In the next section I'll take you through the basics of another important service in AWS serverless stack. It is the Amazon API Gateway. So let's keep going.